My name is Mark Lusk. I'm a professor of social work at the Department of Social Work College of Health Sciences at the University of Texas at El Paso. In this series, we have been talking with faculty members at uh, this institution and related institutions about the importance of culture as a factor in resilience and in the strengths of Mexican and other Hispanic uh, clientele. We're focusing on the strengths model because too often in the treatment of minority populations, and in particular Hispanic populations, which we have to admit is a very large group of people who are very diverse in their backgrounds, but the focus has often been on the pathologies that are evident or the uh, risk factors that they face. And much of the early research and much of the way in which I was trained focused on a deficits model overcoming acculturation issues, adapting ma to majority culture, and so on. But in this series, uh, which began with Dr. Felipe Castro, a professor at the Arizona State University School of Nursing, we began to uh, give you a different set of lenses to look at the problems that people have uh, in dealing with adversity who happen to be Hispanic in origin, and especially those in our part of the country here in El Paso who are uh, Hispanic of Mexican ancestry. The strengths and resilience approach uh, puts the pathology approach on its head because we have to recognize, as been seen by what Dr. Castro said and what our speaker today is going to say, that we have far more strengths and, and assets that can be brought to bear in recovery and in, uh, in the process of uh, uh, achieving well-being than we had ever thought possible. And the more we research we do here at UTEP, and at Arizona State and at the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, the more we see that we have resilience as our, as our primary factor in the process of recovery. In that line, our speaker today is uh, Amelia Leoni Carrete, who's a faculty associate at the Department of Psychiatry at the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center here in El Paso. It's our major medical school in this region. And she trains residents and also young doctors and uh, medical students in, in psychiatry, in psychotherapy, and in doing clinical practice with people, and has, has a wonderful uh, array of experience, especially dealing with children and migrants and Hispanic clients uh, who have faced adversity. She, like other presenters in this series, will be emphasizing the strengths approach to working with Hispanic clients, and in addition to laying out some of the principles of the, the strengths versus deficits approach, that is she's going to look at risk factors and strengths factors and resilience factors. She's also going to bring her clinical experience to bear by talking about some specific examples from her own practice at the School of Medicine. So I'll introduce now uh, Professor Amelia Leone Carrete. I am going to be covering the resilience factors among the Latino or Hispanic population. As a result of viewing this presentation, the participants will be able to identify the common factors contributing to resilience among the Hispanic population, including resilience factors and risk factors. They will be able to recognize the basis of a clinical framework for individual and family intervention with the Latino population. And they will be able to employ the strengths of Hispanic clients when providing individual and family intervention. The Hispanic population has rapidly grown from being 14.8% of the total population to an estimated 17% as of July 1st of 2012, thus becoming the nation's largest ethnicity or racial minority in the United States. But if we are going to be talking about resilience, let's start by defining what resilience is. According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it is the ability to become strong, healthy, and successful again after something bad has happened. According to Cardoso and Thompson, it is a dynamic process characterized by successful outcomes despite experiences of adversity and trauma. Bermudez and Mancini from the University of Georgia postulate a clinical framework in which it is to take into consideration the different dimensions 
of strengths among Latino families. They emphasize the need to focus on strengths rather than on the deficits of families and individuals of Hispanic origin. Cardoso and Thompson, on the other hand, conducted a leadership review of 42 articles, including common themes of resilience among Latino immigrants. And what they report is that four broad domains of risks, as well as four broad domains of protective factors emerged. The four broad domains of risks are immigration, acculturation, discrimination, and a pervasive socioeconomic disadvantage. The four broad domains of protective factors are individual characteristics, family strengths, cultural factors, and community support. I am going to start with the risk factors because I want us to have a better idea of what are some of the difficulties that the Latino immigrants face when they come into the United States. They face stresses of immigration, including multiple losses, leaving their customs, their dominant language, their friends and family networks, and a sense of belonging, which is very important for a healthy social, psychosocial development of the individual. They also experience the loss of familial and cultural support. According to the Grief Recovery Institute, the definition of grief is the conflicting feelings caused by a change or an end in a familiar pattern of behavior. James and Friedman, authors of the Grief Recovery Handbook, sustain that moving may be the most overlooked of all grieving experiences. The next, next risk factor is acculturation. Stresses of learning and adapting to another culture this is particularly difficult for Latino immigrants because some of the core values of the American culture and those of the Hispanic culture conflict. For example, in the American culture, the individualism is a core value. The individual is expected to be self-reliant and, and it is very valued when the person has initiative. But in the Hispanic culture, the core value of family relatedness is very, very important. And the opinion of the family members is very important for the decision making of the individual. Learning a new language. Of course, it is much easier for children to acquire a new language than for adults much more if the adults have to dedicate themselves to provide for the family and don't have enough time to dedicate to learn a new language. And what, and what we are seeing that's happening is that the children acquire the new language and they start communicating among their, themselves in this new language, leaving the parents aside. And this is very conflicting for the Hispanic families because one of the core values is open communication among all members of the family. Adapting to new customs. All of a the sudden, there is no more Dia de Muertos or Day of the Dead celebra celebration, but rather Halloween and trick-or-treating. Discrimination, it's another one of the risk factors. Experiences of discrimination are reported to have a negative impact on the mental health of Latinos, especially as they relate to stereotypes. If you are constantly hearing that you are not welcome, if you are constantly hearing that you are not good enough, that you don't fit in, that this is not your place, you start believing it and your self-image suffers. This is why it is so important that when we are intervening with clients of Hispanic origin, 
we focus on helping, helping them remember who they are and what their roots are. This is a way of empowering them. Anti-immigrant sentiments. We unfortunately see this so openly expressed even in the political arena. Self-image is affected by a lack of sense of belonging. According to Erickson, individuals between the ages of 13 and 19 are going through the psychosocial development stage of identity versus role confusion. This is the time when the teenager is trying to figure out who he or she is and who he or she wants to become. This is the time when they try to fit in. This is the time when they have the need to be part of, to belong to a team or a group. And if these needs are not met, then the individual faces a conflict, a wrong confusion, not really knowing who they are nor who, nor who they want to become. And an institutionalized racism. I'm just going to cite one example. Police brutality against minorities, which is quite often seen still in the United States. The last one of the risk factors is a pervasive socioeconomic disadvantage. Lack of resources, living in unsafe neighborhoods. If you live in an unsafe neighborhood, chances are that the schools in that area are not providing the best quality of education. And if you don't have a good education, chances are that you won't be able to find a job that will pay you enough to have good health care insurance. Another characteristic of uh, the, this pervasive factor is the fact that families sometimes end up living in different locations because they don't find jobs in the same place where the family resides. Let's move to the protective factors. The first one of them is individual characteristics. This is the combination of biological and psychosocial influences, self-esteem, self-mastery, and self-agency. Campbell, in 2008, conducted a study of Mexican immigrant women and found that these very attributes, self-esteem, self-mastery, and self-agency, led to a strong desire for employment, education, and autonomy. I have had the opportunity to work with multiple families that are coming to the United States fleeing from the violence in Mexico. And I worked with this family that was uh, referred to me because the kids were dealing with uh, trauma and grief issues. This was a family that was well established here in the United States. The kids were going to school, mom was a homestay mom, and the father had a stable job. But living in the border gave them the opportunity to visit uh, the grandparents. Every weekend they would go to the Mexican side of the border to visit. This was a time where the uh, where extortions were, had a high rate at the Mexican side of the border. And the grandpa had um, a small business that he was running. He had received several threats. And on one of the occasions when they visited grandpa, the father was repairing his father's car when two men came out of a vehicle and shot him in front of the, of the children. The mother, all of a sudden, was faced with the reality of becoming the head of household. But this lady was illiterate. She didn't know how to drive, and she had no idea of where to start. But she did know something, that she was going to make sure that her children were fine. 
This lady learned to maneuver the system. She also learned how to read and write. And she also was able to find a job. Nowadays, the oldest one of these kids is a high school student, and the other one is about to start high school as well. For children and adolescents, many studies have shown the empowered effects of positive ethnic identity. Individual resilience is embedded in dichos, popular sayings or proverbs. These are a fundamental aspect of the Hispanic family discourse. This is what families use to teach their kids their values and beliefs, and even to reprimand them sometimes. They reflect the spirit of maintaining a positive disposition and a sense of determination. These are spiritual beliefs that strengthen, strengthen the sense of resilience and foster sense of unity in the face of adversity. Al que no habla, Dios no lo oye. He who does not speak, God won't hear. So if you need something, ask for help. Use your resources. The core and belief of familyism. The personal interests of the individual are subordinated to the values and demands of the family. It stresses family loyalty, interdependence over independence, and cooperation over competition. I had the opportunity to see a clear example of families. 50% of my time as faculty at Texas Tech University, I spent it at the University Medical Center Department of Emergency Department as part of the Council Liaison Psychiatric Team. Whenever there is a um, mental health emergency, we are consulted. And this is how we became in touch with this young man who was in his 20s and was transported to the hospital by the uh, Border Patrol. He was detained here in El Paso when he was on his way back to Mexico. And the Border Patrol agents realized that he was not doing well, so they transported him to the hospital, and we were consulted. He expressed that he had only been eating fruit and drinking water for five months. He disclosed that he had been sexually assaulted by two men in his place of employment in the state of Nevada five months prior to the evaluation. And he shared his story with us. He said that he had graduated as the number one student of his high school class. He had received several scholarships and was in the process of applying to be accepted in the medical school in central Mexico where his hometown was. He said that he used to volunteer at the Red Cross and other agencies and was well respected in his community. Everything was fine, but they received the bad news that mom had cancer and they did not have the means to pay for her treatment. So his dreams had to be put aside. As he decided to immigrate to the United States and work as much as he could and save as much as he could to go back and take the money for her mother's treatment. He told us that he had experienced the most horrific things that he had not even ever thought that he could experience, but that he not regret it. He said that he was now going home with the money for his mother's treatment. Familism, it's a value thought to be the basis of the Cuban, Mexican-American, and Puerto Rican families. Another aspect of the family strengths is family cohesiveness. The individual's life 
revolves around the extended family. An extended family may also include the godparents, who are quite involved in the upbringing of the godchild, and even the neighbors. It is not unusual to see in the Hispanic neighborhoods that neighbors take care of all the children as if they were their own. And they will report to the parents if these kids are misbehaving or hanging out with the grown crowd because they take care of them as if they were their own. According to Martinez, the Garmo and Eddie, particularly important protective factors promoting well-being among middle school students are parental relationship. This is why, once again, I, I stress it. It's very important that they maintain their language because this way the open communication between children and parents, it's always there. Family pride and family support. Whenever I talk about family pride, the image of this seven-year-old who was a participant in a group that I was facilitating at, with kids that were undergoing cancer treatment at El Paso Children's Hospital. She came to the first session very enthusiastic and with her beautiful hat shade. The first thing she said was, why am I here? And I responded, why do you think you're here? She said, maybe because I have cancer. And before I could even reply, she said, but I still don't understand because I am a Ruiz. And I asked her, and what does being a Ruiz mean to you? She said, ha. my daddy says that we, the Ruizes, are very strong very tough, and we can defeat anything. And I, as a Ruiz, am going to defeat cancer. And I thought, what a beautiful way of this father to empower his daughter who was going through such difficult circumstances. McCubbin, McCubbin and Thompson sustained the the stronger the family's sense of we-ness, the stronger the family's resilience. D'Angelo and colleagues suggest guideline, guidelines for helping children who are trying to overcome the effects of parents' depression. These guidelines include understanding the risks and protective factors of Hispanic or Latino families, focusing on approaches based on the importance of family-centered strengths-based interventions, and emphasizing the importance of including the family's immigration migration narrative. I think we can agree that immigrating to a different country is very difficult and many times traumatizing. And when people are traumatized, they need to tell their stories. It's just that it is not always easy because they are re-experiencing the trauma, but they cannot express it with words. This is where we come in. This is where we can provide them with the means to do it by giving them the opportunity to write about it, by, by giving them the, the opportunity to draw pictures, narrating what happened, or even giving them the opportunity to make figures with clay. And then we become their witnesses. Then we become that ear that they didn't have before. Then we become the port of safety. We need to empower them. We need to help them realize that they have a voice and they, they can use it. Summarizing the protective factors that increase resilience among Latino 
or Hispanic families. Familism, family cohesiveness, being bicultural, family pride, parental support, and ethnic pride. The next protective factor is the cultural factor. The role of culture is reported to be especially relevant in the development of resilience among Hispanic families. The Hispanic cultural values are reported to be linked to better health outcomes when compared with non-Hispanic whites. Personalism, the ability to maintain positive interpersonal relationships. Respeto, respect. Lealtad, loyalty. Consejos, advice. Dichos and fatalism. God never gives you more than you can bear. Dios nunca te da más de lo que puedas soportar. Being bicultural is an important resilience factor. Not only adopting the new culture, but maintaining the language, social and cultural tradi traditions of their own background. Cooking their dishes the way they, did, they used to do it in their hometown. Maintaining their traditions, their celebrations, when a baby is born, when there is a wedding, when there is a funeral. These are, this is essential for maintaining a positive psychological and cognitive development. According to Kimbrough, Sustek, Goldman, and Rodriguez, lower levels of assimilation in the United States have been linked to better health outcomes. And factors contributing to higher academic achievement are persistent parental support. If the parents get involved in the education of their kids, the children feel the support and are able to have a better academic achievement. A greater levels of ethnic identity and family interdependence. Reaching out to the fa immediate or extended family is very common in the Hispanic culture. Even for homework, homework assignments, when the parents do not completely understand what the assignment is supposed to be about, they reach out to the cousins, to the aunts, to other people that can help them. And even to take care of children or of grandparents, they reach out to extend that family. This is very common. Embracing familyism as a value resulted in familial stability which is associ associated with better physical health behaviors, higher likelihood of seeking medical or psychological health care, and lower perceived levels of stress. Kimbrough, Substack, Goldman, and Rodriguez report that Latinos tend to do better than other cultural groups despite their lower socioeconomic status, calling this the Hispanic paradox. Foreign-born Latinos have better health outcomes when compared to other race or ethnicity groups. Lower mortality and morbidity rates than native-born. And the authors report that this could be related to the healthy migrant effect. People that immigrate may be healthier than those that stay behind. And this makes sense if we think about the difficulties that Latino immigrants have to face when they come into the, Uni the United States. Summarizing the cultural factors that contribute, to that contribute to resilience, keeping strong ties with one's ethnic culture, ethnic pride and appreciation of own culture's traditions, values, and beliefs, Having a positive ethnic identity is essential to resilience among Latinos. Focusing on having a positive attitude towards life, even after traumatic events, and having social support. The last one of the protective factors is community and social support. 
positive community support and extended networks, uh, community networks are key factors for resilience. Formal support groups from recognized organizational sources, such as shelter and counseling, are the resilience factor for women dealing with partnered violence situations. Women going through this uh, type of situations usually do not reach out to the family or the extended family for support. The authors, the authors argue that this could be related to the concept of Marianismo, which is the thought that women should follow the steps of Virgin Mary and just accept humbly accept their fate, not trying to change it, not trying to challenge it, just accepting their fate. The other aspect of uh, this protective factor is immigrants' religious groups, which include the Mexican cultural values of collectivism, respect for authority, and loyalty. In conclusion, focusing on the risk and protective factors opens the possibility of reducing negative outcomes and enhances resilience. The importance of family and culture was the most common factor of resilience among Hispanic families. Enriching aspects of strengths and resilience is predominantly important when working with Latino family systems. Increased resiliency decreases emotional disturbance. The ability to seek help was considered the most important factor regarding resilience. Those that look for help, of course, were the ones that received the most. We need to focus on factors contributing to resilience, individual and family strengths, rather than on the pathological issues that our clients present when working with Latino or Hispanic populations. This is a very rich population. It's a population that is rich in strengths and resilience. Let's use that very richness to help them see what they are capable of doing. Let's help them spread their wings and let's sit back and be amazed of what they are capable of accomplishing. Thank you very much.